Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the Resistance Podcast. This is co-host Joe Gallagher here with David Gordon. Before we dive into today's episode, we just wanted to point out, check out Church Militant's bookstore. It's got great content like David's book, Rules for Retrogrades, books by past guests such as Finding Vigano by Dr. Robert Moynihan and um, Three Marks of Manhood by Dr. G.C. Dillsaver. Also, be sure to check out the bookstore for the Church Militant Calendar. It's a great gift. It's full of beautiful pictures of the apostolate. And also look forward to the next year's calendar that's going to be the men of Church Militant flexing. I, d- I, I don't know if we'd be able to get that one approved, but I think I could, I could probably be the cover photo for that. Right. Yeah. Really. Where's my beach ball? Flexing those 12-inch biceps. Amen. And before we dive into today's topic, just one more time, if you guys like what we have to say, please be sure to like, subscribe to Church Militant, like this video, and share the video. Send it to your friends. This is important stuff, what, what's going on right now. It has to be talked about. Absolutely. Part of getting the message out there means swelling our ranks, getting people on board. You know, recruiting, these are all huge things because even if we have the best people in the world, if we only have a hundred of us and we're trying to change the national conversation, we're destined to fail. We also need just big, fat numbers and and in order to prevail. And follow us. Oh, no, go ahead. Please do follow us on Twitter. Follow us on social media. There's an opportunity to interact and have good social commentary. Absolutely. Uh, specifically, I think I'm going to start posting a little bit more to Parlor because I've been a little lazy. Um, and lastly, there's a uh, sign-up link in the show notes, as always. In a nutshell, we are tired of losing. Conservatives have constantly been defeated, pummeled. It's not even close, destroyed by the liberals. And there's reasons for that. And David and I are going to go through those all today. But at the end of the day, it's going to take a lifestyle change for every single one of us. David, myself, people at Church Militant, all listeners, all members of the Church Militant family, whether you're on campus or across the country, overseas in the Philippines, who knows. But it's going to take a lifestyle change and it's going to take a commitment that I don't think most of us have had up to this point. Well, the fact is that conservatives are constantly losing to liberals and people wonder why and we're frustrated there's a sense of overwhelming frustration in the nation after biden and harris prevailed in this election by hook or by crook over donald trump and mike pence people are are looking at the sky and wondering why did this happen and if we don't figure out why it is that the right loses so often then we are destined we are doomed to keep repeating the ignominious fate of losing to the bad guys the fact is now is a time of reckoning where we need to look at what we've done wrong and plan so that we get things right for the future there was no reason for donald trump to lose this election there was no reason he we got outplayed We got outplayed by uh, an opponent with superior tactics and superior strategy. They weaponized the COVID virus. Uh, They used that to expand their voter rolls. Uh, They they used that to push mail-in voting, which does expand the voter base, which is also very well open to fraudulent voting. And then they also demonized Donald Trump. They were very specific with their message, and we were totally undisciplined with our message. They've been pushing BLM, uh, systemic racism, Antifa, um, the the 1% versus the 99% narrative for so long, making it seem like conservatives are out of touch, that they are just shills for big corporations and painting Democrat voters and just average Americans as enemies of the right. And we've let it happen. We've let them push their narrative without without any significant resistance. And that is the reason we are doomed to what we are to suffer for the next four years. So how do we get back on track? 
Um, how do we make it so that our acts of resistance will gain popular support, will catch the media's eye? How do we push our narrative and stop the left from having a monopoly on pushing their narrative? How do we do it? Dave, I know that we have four points listed right here that we're going to touch on, but there's one that just came to mind and I wanted to throw it at you and see what you think. So with that, I have personally been reflecting and I've found that something that's beneficial is finding a type of detachment, almost removing oneself from the need and the anger of what's going on so that we can be cool, calm, collected, and focused, keeping everything together. Because I think that as faithful Catholics, as people of goodwill, we see all of these injustices and it infuriates us to a point where we just want to lash out and we don't take the time to think, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's step back. Let's co communicate with our brothers. Let's figure out what we can do before we just jump the gun. Right. And that plays right into the devil's hands because it's like instead of boxing cool and calm and sticking to a game plan we're brawling wildly we're, we're throwing swing, haymakers right we're swinging wildly and we're going to get countered and that's what you saw at the capitol protest um this uh on wednesday january 6th i believe uh that's what you saw take place there it was a disorganized act of rage that played into the enemy's hands that played into the left's hands it was uh, aggression. It was sheer aggression. Aggression that I understand, by the way, because we are so frustrated. We're so tired of getting whipped. We are so sick of not having recourse to the courts, to politicians. We feel like our cries are falling on deaf ears. And so people are lashing out. But just like a boxer who takes a punch to the nose and then blindly rushes in in an act of rage, we are leaving ourselves open to getting countered and then we are going to get knocked out. All that has come in the wake of the rushing of Capitol Hill, the storming of the Capitol building, is that the media has successfully demonized every single Trump voter out there. They have used it to sully Donald Trump's reputation. The, they have used it to sully everything he's done for the last four years. They've used it to brand many rank and file conservatives as domestic terrorists. And they're going to use it as a bludgeon to get more Democrats elected and to make Republicans ashamed of being Republican. And it accomplished nothing. At the end of the day, we are we are played like a fiddle. I mean, we were played like a fiddle. I, it's so, it's time to regroup. That's right, Joe. We were played like a fiddle. And I think a lot of people, in, in a strange sense, because they're so used to Republicans and conservatives doing nothing in the wake of national corruption, uh, liberal bullying, progressive shenanigans they're so used to seeing our side do nothing that there was a part of everybody that applauded this action because it was a boiling over of rage and they saw it as something that was actually doing a palpable tangible kinetic act as opposed to it just taking one on the chin and we're so used to it i mean think of all of the mischief that's been ushered in by the left in the last couple of decades uh, even looking at the Obama administration, we're sick of things like DACA, unconstitutional amnesty for a bunch of illegal immigrants. We're sick of the court foisting the homosexual agenda on us, um, creating this, quote, right to homosexual, quote, marriage, um, just out of whole cloth, just making it up out of thin air. Uh, we're sick of the court's uh, pretending that there is a right for women to slaughter their own babies in utero. We're sick of courts pretending there's a right to pornography. Sick of courts pretending there's a right to contraception. We are all tired of it. We're tired of the lawlessness of the left. So in the past decades, especially 60s, 70s, 80s, 
we were just run over. We were overrun and there was no resistance. Conservatives, quote unquote, conservatives gave way at every turn, every place they could. So we're sick of our politicians capitulating and giving in. So people were in a weird way, even though what just happened was counterproductive, people in a weird way were happy to see something happen. But we have to be disciplined. We can't just have undisciplined, untrammeled rage pouring over. It's counterproductive and it destroys the movement. It destroys the things that we're actually fighting for. So what makes leftist demonstrations successful? What makes them be able to see actual movement towards their goals? Whereas rightist demonstrations are usually futile and they fail to move the ball nationally. Well, first off, I don't think we have a George Soros. <laughs> I don't think that we have a George Soros. But the first point that we have here is we need to be organized. This is something that we have said in some of the earliest podcasts months ago, is that we need to be organized behind a specific effort. And now this is in regards specifically to these movements that are on a national scale. We need to be organized behind a specific effort. I saw this flyer that talked about this uh, two days ago, two day, uh, on Wednesday, talking about the movement. And I see all of these different movements having their insignias and their logos uh, at the bottom of the flyer. And at first I was like, oh, wow, that's really cool. They're all coming together. But no, 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 no. There should have been just one thing. Stop the steal that was disseminated, trickled down. All of those organizations should have gotten behind just one specific agenda, not, hey, come march for Trump. Hey, let's do a Jericho march. Hey, why not just implement it all into one specific movement? That's the first thing, because right when that happens is you have different point men and you have people that are most likely involved from with different organizations. I know that resistance people were there, but we said, hey, connect with Debbie just to connect with her for this specific reason, not because we wanted to do a resistance march, but because we knew that there was this large event happening for Stop the Steal, and that's what we needed to rally towards. That is the first big point. It's like there's too many chefs in the kitchen. And they spoil, they spoil the pot, as the old adage goes. The fact is you need centralization. You need a central organizing apparatus that is able to give marching orders. Otherwise, there's chaos and you have a bunch of people in the streets that don't know what to do. Why are they in the streets? Our politicians ignore us. It's funny. People say Washington is tone deaf. Washington is tuned out. Washington is detached. Our politicians don't care what the people say. That's true. So it's an act of lunacy to think that just going there and walking around the streets of Washington holding some signs is going to do anything. That's what the losing pro-life movement has done. How much movement have we seen in pro-life issues in terms of the opinion of the American populace? Not much at all. 83% believe that abortion should be legal and should you, you should have recourse to abortion in at least some circumstances. That is a failure. Don't buy the rosy picture painted by pro-life groups about the success of the movement. Just walking around outside of an abortion clinic with a sign is not going to do much. And it's the same thing with Washington. Just walking around outside Washington doesn't do much. You can't treat things as a picnic luncheon where you go to socialize with other members of the Tea Party. Conservative activism has become too much a picnic, a socialization group. There's a place for that. Great. Get together with like-minded people. Get together with like-minded friends. But do it not under the, the guise of a national movement or a day of protest. When you're having a day of protest, you have to actually do things with teeth. You're, you have to actually do things that are going to get the attention of those whose attention you seek. And if I may say, all of this in reference to a national movement, it applies and this is why we're talking about it, of course, it applies to each and every single one of our local chapters of resistance. 
a citywide movement needs to be constructed the same exact way as a national wide na- nationwide movement. Right. We can have federalism. There can be an intra city movement and that group will be a discrete group that's giving orders, giving marching orders to the boots on the ground. Definitely. But when you come together at the national level, there needs to be a group directing it nationally. There has to be centralization. Have you ever seen after a national event when the left starts to spin things so that it actually helps them, it it goes into their narrative, it drives their agenda? After every national shooting, you have leftist congressmen, leftist pundits on every channel saying the same few things and they have discipline they don't get off their talking points it's because they have centralization there are groups out there sending out memos saying these are the few things you need to say we need common sense gun control legislation they they get it they say it they repeat it ad nauseum and then the dronish lemmings in the american public are like gee we need common sense gun control legislation and that's how you do it. Americans have a short attention span. We're not a nation of scholars. You have to have discipline pushing your point. The only way you can know which points to push with discipline, though, is by having a central organizing apparatus. And if you don't have it, guess what? You're going to fail. Guys, the fact is that centralization creates the opportunity and the environment where discipline can flourish. The right's message is all over the place. The right's message, there's 500 points of view, and some of them contradict each other. You're not going to win a national debate where voters and people who are tuning in to television have about an eight-second attention span when you're pushing 500 different points. You have to dumb things down. You have to make things short and sweet. And that's not to say that there's no place for deep intellectual work on the right. There absolutely is. But it needs to be formative of the message that we're pushing to voters, to people who are just average Americans tuning in to television. The intellectual warfare can be done behind the scenes, but then what we're presenting to people needs to be simplified. And somebody... Some central apparatus needs to be the one coming up with what that message that we are going to reach out to the average Joe American is. Somebody has to formulate the content of that message, and then we need our boots on the ground to trust in that leadership and say we are going to push this message so that it resounds with the American public, so that they remember it. Think about it. Why do commercials use jingles? So it gets stuck in your head and you think about it all day. We need a message that's going to get stuck in people's head and they think about it all day. What did BLM and Antifa say? They say systemic racism, systemic racism, defund the police. What is more asinine that you can think of than defunding the people that are there to protect us, the people that we pay taxes to so that they give us protection against Death, great bodily harm, loss of property. Against the people saying defund them. (laughs) Right, exactly. What's more asinine? That stupid, suicidal, self-defeating message, because it has been regurgitated ad nauseum by the drones on the left, it has made headway. And then you have the idiots in Congress, uh, in the left, in Congress, like AOC and the, quote, squad, It catches on with them, and then they start saying it, and then it gains national traction. That's how these things work. If you can get a message as stupid and suicidal as defund the police to catch on with Joe American, even though it's not fully caught on, only about a quarter of America is suicidal enough to have actually embraced that. It's, you can get anything to, you can get them to believe anything. And since conservatism is true, and truth is inherently attractive then think about what if we use some strategy to tell the truth think about how much that will catch on and that is what frightens the left 
So you need centralization. You cannot win without it. You have to have discipline. You can't have your guys saying 200 different things, pushing 200 different points at once. Media time, media attention is precious and scant and rare. You have to use it. You have to use each one of your punches to the greatest effect and make it count. To that, I think that I do want to speak to this and then I want to make a point stepping back a little bit in regards to organization. They are organized. What they do is they have their people say, okay, this is our slogan. Okay, this is what we're going to rally. Okay, we're going to have our politicians that are friendly to our cause speak in support of it. Okay, we're going to call our friends at the local news station or at CNN, the Communist News Network, and have them cover it with this angle. They have all of those places or all of those pieces in place before they even lift a finger. That takes months of planning. That takes so much effort, time, brain power for that to be implemented and to see success. Communism has been around for hundreds of years. I was actually reading an article from the Epic Times, Epoch Times. People say it different yeah, ways. Which I still haven't haven't settled on it. I say it, you know, if somebody seems a little bit more sophisticated, I, I say epic, but if it's just Joe, I'm like epoch. Oh my epoch. God. Epoch. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I would have thought the fancier way would be epoch because that's like the British way and you know, people tend to couple the British accent with a little bit more sophistication. Of course, they drink tea at lunch. Why yes, wouldn't it's, we? It's think that. epic. Yeah. Anyway, um, I was reading this uh, article from the Epic Times, and it talked about this. Uh, it was commentary for this transformation of communism and how it made this massive shift from Marx and these Bolsheviks, this violent revolution, to after the Berlin Wall coming down, Chinese communism came into play, and they were very, let's play by the rules. Let's bring things in slowly. Let's avoid the violence because we have enough people uh, underway now. We have people that have bought into this, that want the power or are just brainwashed enough to think that this actually works. And so China dropped the violence and they picked up, hey, we'll give you great deals. And they capitalized on, well, the fallen nature of man and greed and low, late, low cost labor. And they weaseled their way in that way. That takes Decades. That took decades to happen. And now look where China is. China did that back in what? The 80s, the 90s, when they became favored trade partner. That takes decades, over 100 years. And now communism finally has its teeth sinking in on the neck of the freest country ever to be in existence. So there's no question that with this aggravation, this emotional drive, it needs to be controlled and it needs to be funneled into a systemized, patient, strategic objective. And so with that point, this, this is where I want to uh, dial back a little bit. Either the main core group of any initiative needs to come together, sit down, and speak very openly. Let's figure out what our problems are. And then from there, let's see what the low-hanging fruit is. And let's see how long this will take. And let's be willing to critique and object to one another but it takes a small nucleus of people to figure out what the plan is but these strategy sessions are so important because do you, they didn't just think of this overnight it took months to plan that's the point that i just wanted to make dave sorry to cut you off no not at all it's an important point to be made i'm glad you did and here's the thing guys i, I hear you i hear everybody saying well i just want to withdraw now we we've lost this battle I just want to withdraw into prayer. It's like, okay, no, no, no. God is not our servant. We are the servants of God. You don't just withdraw into prayer. You use your failures to push you to succeed in the temporal way. Now, of course, that needs to be girded with prayer. We must have prayer and the sacraments or else we will fail. But there's a flip side of that too. You can have prayer and the sacraments, but if you're only relying on God, that's tempting God. That's disordered. You can't only rely on God. He could do anything he wanted instantaneously. God could, just by willing it, have had Donald Trump win a second term 
as president. God could, just by willing it, have abortion be overturned, Roe v. Wade be overturned. God could, just by willing it, have it be that pornography is made illegal in America. But the fact is, God is the creator. He is the just king. He is the righteous Lord. And he deserves our service. He created us to bear his image to the world. Just like a king makes use of his soldiers to bear his banner to the nation. We are the soldiers of Christ. We must use our talents, put our talents to work in his service. So don't just say, I'm going to withdraw into prayer. That's tempting God. It's actually sinful. You better bust your butts to do the will of God. We are his instruments. We are his servants. And that means using strategy. A boxer who gets punched in the nose and knocked down, if he just gets up and retreats to his corner and quits in his corner, he loses the match. If a boxer gets punched in the nose and knocked down, and he just blindly rushes in without using discipline, without sticking to a fight plan, he's going to get knocked out. We have to have a plan and stick to it. And that takes, again, a trainer, an organizer. We must have centralization. We must have organization. Without it, we will flounder. Without it, we will fail. Why is it that the right is repeating its mistakes of the past without changing them. We are being defeated. It's time to change strategy. Or better yet, it's time to begin using a strategy and not just trying to be a hodgepodge of disordered grassroots movements that are somehow trying to drive a message. Now again, that is a difference between local initiatives that are specific to their area. From what I understand, just to clarify, Dave, just because I want to make sure it's a hodgepodge of, wow, our election got stolen because we all have that same message and we're going about it different ways. Whereas local initiatives that we've been talking about for months with resistance are unique to their area and they're held just to that area on that local change, local action, local change, national action. We want national change. That was the big, I just wanted to make sure that that was right. Right. Okay. Local action, local centralization. National action, national centralization. The, the civil rights movement succeeded in America because it had a figurehead, Martin Luther King. And he had a message. And people were using the method that he proposed, passive resistance. That's why they succeeded. They had a disciplined message, which was that men should be judged not based on the color of their skin, but on the content of their character, and that there should be equality before the law. And that message repeated and repeated and repeated, and because it has truth within it, it caught on and they won. But they had centralization, they had a figurehead, and somebody doling out marching orders, and that's what we need. So we've touched on the need to be organized, to strategize, to be prepared, how it takes months of planning and discussion and organization, picking and choosing what everything is going to be. And that ties in, we've touched on it and you just said it there. There needs to be a specific message. What do we want to get across? Like with Martin Luther King, it was all rights, all men, forgive me, all men are created equal. All men are treated equally under the law. For resistance, locally or nationally, we need to have a message that is formulated and decided upon far before we start implementing our actions. For example, look at Complicit Clergy and the McCarrick Report. Complicit Clergy put together these printable dollar bills that had Theodore McCarrick and James Grine on one end, and on the back, it was McCarrick again, the McCarrick Bucks, asking, where's the report? And the initiative was for people all over the country to print these out and stuff them into the collection envelopes at the cathedrals, at the parishes, especially where McCarrick had a big, heavy influence. Those messages, they stick with you and it needs to be picked and focused on. You can't abandon the message halfway through. So that's all the more reason to be prepared and organized and understanding, can this fall apart? I honestly want to recommend, I don't want to dive into it for the sake of time, but look at just war theory. It talks about all of these things 
is this the, what are the chances of this working out in our favor? Are there risks? What's the proportionality of it all? Have we tried all other tactics that are more peaceful? I just recommend checking that out for anybody that's wanting to start getting together in these resistance groups and following this type of template. So Joe has introduced message for us. And please note that all of these points that we're bringing up are discrete components of good activism. To have good activism, you have to have organization, centralization, message, and goal. And they're all integrally intertwined. They're inseparable. It's almost impossible to talk about one without talking about the others. So we're going to talk closely about message and goal um, in the next few minutes. We're going to kind of pivot back and forth between them because they're so closely intertwined. But the fact is you have to have a disciplined message because people are constantly being bombarded with different points so that if you're making 200 conservative points to somebody, the points that you most want to get across are going to have become white noise, background noise that they simply tune out. You have to tell people what's important. So turning to the events of this week and the storming of the Capitol, here was an opportunity, a golden opportunity to drive our point home and to have a media that was going to have to cover the message no matter what. They couldn't simply ignore this. So you have all these people in Washington, D.C. marching and all of those people, they were marching around and the general message was to stop the steal, right? So that's a goal. But the message they needed to have been saying, all we want is an audit of the election. That's why we're here, audit the election, and then there can be a peaceful transition of power. All we want is fairness, all we want is transparency, and all we want is to know that our government is legitimate and not corrupt. Now, who could be against that? No one, at least, I mean, of course, the left would be against it because they're the beneficiaries of fallen human nature and government corruption and voter fraud. We know that, but they can't say that out loud. So there would be strong political pressure on them if we only had a coherent message to actually give ground. So imagine if all of those people who marched on Washington, D.C. sat down where they were and said, we're not moving. We're going to stage a sit-in until you audit the election. Give us a 10-day audit of the election before the swearing-in on January 20th of Joe Biden. Um, and we'll, let's just make sure everything was on the up and up. And if one central organization had directed each and every person, and there were hundreds of thousands in Washington, D.C., if they had all been giving marching orders by one centralized organization to simply say, I am not going to leave my position here until we audit the election. And they're getting pulled off of roads. Police are arresting them, um, but they're, they're not being violent. They're not breaking things. They're not destroying property. What they're doing is just sitting where they are and saying, I'm not moving of my own free will until this election is audited and you're going to have to arrest me if you want me to leave, then think about what that would do. The American public has no stomach to see patriotic Americans being arrested simply because they're calling for uh, the confirmation of the legitimacy of an election, an election that was rife with at least the appearance of impropriety, at least the opportunity for impropriety. Who would stomach that? Everybody wants fair and just elections, except for progressives, except for the far left. But everybody that's just your rank and file American is going to say, yeah, I want fair elections. These people are totally reasonable. All they're calling for is the confirmation that this election was fair. And the media, they're going to have to cover it if patriotic Americans are being dragged away by Capitol Police simply saying things like we want the fair election. We want an audit of the election. That would move the popular discussion. It would be a snapshot in people's heads. They're going to have this image of good 
patriotic Americans, red-blooded Americans, people that could be their neighbors or family or friends being dragged away simply for calling for um, transparency in an election. No one could stomach that, and that would move the ball, and that would get sufficient pressure on the Democrats to actually do something or at least capitulate to Republican demands. It gives our leadership, our elected officials, some ammunition to use. That's what we needed to do. I want to highlight a point that you made earlier, Dave, and it's so true. And why aren't we using this? They say things like, love is love, black lives matter. Well, love is love. That's true. Green is green. And black lives do matter. This is very true. All lives matter. Just wanted to throw that one out there. Yeah, definitely. And Wait, that's racist. You can't say all lives matter. Oh, boy. Yeah, well, you know what? I said it. You know what I'm going to say? Huh? White lives matter. And red lives matter. Yeah. And green lives matter. For... Wait, are we allowed to say red? I don't know. Redskins changed their name, so. That's true. What about uh, green lives for any reptilians? or <laughs> yeah. All the believers out there. Um these sayings are so easy and so simple and they're agreeable. You hear them at f and at first impression, which are which is so important. You think, "Oh, yeah." And this is and I I'm sorry, but I think that a message like stop the steal or Jericho march, the ma the goal is good, but the message isn't isn't simple enough. It's not clean enough and it's not Are you ready? Here it comes. It's not inclusive enough. It's not a statement that's generic enough to capture the ear of both sides. Stop the Steal makes a very straightforward command that immediately is argued over. But like you're saying, Dave, wanting an audit just to ensure a fair election. Now, that's a much different type of message. Now, I don't have the creativity to... Think of one on the fly that would uh, switch with it. Stop the steal is great for every conservative out there, but is it enough for people that were on the fence or for some more centrist liberals? I, I honestly, I don't think so. So with a message, it should ref be reflective of the goal. It should be reflective of the entire action that we're taking, but it needs to be able to be articulated in a way that captures the ear of both friend and foe. Again, there's not going to be much daylight between message and goal. So, for example, um, putting this in the context of the recent election and the hijinks and mischief that's been going on, the goal, of course, is stop the steal. And the, the message for that goal should be audit the election. And you just keep saying this and keep saying this and driving the point home, and eventually it's going to catch on. And the media will be forced to give you your coverage, give you your airtime, even though they don't want to. They're an enemy. But you have to know how to manipulate your enemy to making them do what you want. They're going to take everything that conservatives do and paint it in a bad light. But there's almost no way to take a bunch of people peacefully marching on the Capitol, not destroying things, and calling simply for an audit and turn that into something negative. It makes us seem reasonable and they will have to cover it. And that's the fact. So you have to manipulate them. And the only way to do that is simply by being on point, uh, being univocal with everybody saying the same thing over and over. There's not going to be digressions. There's not going to be tangents. They're not going to be people, uh, you know, shouting 700 different messages. There's one. And that is going to further the goal. We all, we all have to know what the goal is, though. And again, that's where centralization comes into play. Because without centralization, you don't know what the goal is. Are people marching on Washington in show of support for Donald Trump? Are people marching on Washington because they don't like Joe Biden and Kamala Harris? Are people marching on Washington because they want to shrink the size of government? Are people marching on Washington because they're dissatisfied with the result of the election? Are people marching on Washington because they think the election was unfair and possibly stolen? There's an infinite list of things that are closely related, 
but are not one and the same point, and we need to make the purpose explicit. So that requires centralization. You know, that's it, and uh, I just want to make this point and then close out. It's an obvious point, but we need pe if people are going to march to stop the steal, they need to be all marching with the understanding, commitment, and belief that the election was stolen. We don't want a difference in opinion in what the goal is and what the message is and in the objectives and in the tactics. If people are going to be involved in the movement, if members of the resistance are going to be involved, make sure that all discussion, discourse, and debate, disagreements are left at the strategy session. Because if you bring any of that into the action aspect of any initiative, whether you're BLM, whether you're Antifa, whether you are church militant resistance, TFP, I can go on and on. You need to have ideological cohesion. To pull from rules for retrogrades, there are no coalitions. So again, guys, remember, good activism has four components. Organization, centralization, message, and goal. Organization, centralization, message, and goal. If you don't stick to those four points, if they're not all in place, if those components don't exist, then your movement is just rabble that's destined to fail. It's just swinging wildly. It's throwing haymakers. You have to have those four things or else you're going to lose. And those four things, when girded, when combined with prayer and the sacraments, are going to make us an indestructible force, an invincible force, one that will prevail for Christ, for truth, for justice, for righteousness. And that's the ultimate goal. So use strategy, fight smart, don't get discouraged, get motivated, and get smart. Thank you so much for listening, guys, and we will catch you for next week's episode of the Resistance Podcast.